um so everybody come who's coming in we had some issues starting the meeting uh for the members of the subcommittee that are coming we are uh this is automatically recording first of all this is hello can you hear me can you hear me i can hear you this is robert <laughs> okay so we're already recording because this is automatic so be aware of that we haven't started the meeting we had some issues starting the meeting uh booker can you hear me looks like you can't um so what i did um so i'm gonna wait for hey javier is everything going okay yeah uh, we uh, so uh, we never got any email about that we were the ones to use uh the credentials to start the meeting so we were waiting for a while until i said you know i'm gonna go back in emails from past meeting and find the user and password and i just sign in oh i'm so <laughs> sorry i thought that, that sent to you all my bad it's okay don't worry about it but okay. we're here right now <laughs> great okay well i'm glad that you're in do you need anything um else no i think we're fine Thank you. Okay. Awesome. All right. Have a good meeting. Thank you. Bye. You're the best. Um, <laughs> so we're going to wait for people to come in. As you heard, we have a little hiccups uh, coming in. Just for everybody to be aware of, uh, we are we're having to start a meeting. We have a little hiccup with the connection and signing in. Uh, we're, uh, even though we haven't started a meeting, it's already this is already being recorded. So just be aware of it. We're going to be waiting a little bit. I think Alex is trying to connect. Um, there you are. I Booker. Can you hear me, Booker? Alex, can you hear me? Yes. Can okay. you hear me? Yes. Just be aware that this is automatically recording, even though we haven't started the meeting. Okay. Um, I ended up looking in past links and the emails from Noah, and I just signed into that, and I didn't know we were supposed to do that and not wait for her. Um, cool. Oh, right. Did they tell us they weren't going to be able to nope. be here? No, okay. not this time. There had been times that we had been told, not this one, but because we were uh, sort of in this uh, conundrum, I just went look in previous emails and I just sign in. Okay, great. But now we're here. Yes, great. <laughs> so it looks like Carol's coming. I think Booker is having trouble with the connection because I don't see him having uh, audio. Oh, yeah. It, it wouldn't let me. I had to try multiple times. I saw it. Uh, yeah. Somebody told me that today they have some, they had to, a, a friend in UMass said that she told me that they had to cancel a meeting in UMass because of connectivity issues mm -hmm. with Zoom. So, um, you know, things happen. Yeah. Booker is coming back. Just for every anybody coming in, uh, this is automatically recording. We have a little hiccup with the uh, with the connection, so now we're here. We're gonna start in a little bit. Just waiting for everybody to come in. Um, we are already recording. Seven forty six. Uh, Booker, do you want to chair the meeting or you're muted? You're muted. I guess that's my ambivalence. Um, I'll be glad to <laughs> chair the rest of the meeting after you, if you don't mind doing the public comment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you're, you're going to time it, right? Yes, I will. Excellent. It's good to see you, by the way. It's good to see you. I'm sorry I missed you last night, though I, I spent a lot of time watching you this afternoon. Intriguing. 
Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're gonna call to order the Northampton Police Review Commission Alternative to Police and Subcommittee. Today is January 20, 2021. This meeting is from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Uh, this meeting is being recorded on Zoom. And we're going to start with the roll call. And I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to start at roll call. Alex? Here. Carol? Here. Here. Booker? Here. Javier? Here. So we have full house. Excellent. Um, we're going to do the parole of the meeting minutes. Everybody had the chance to take a look to the minutes. So, um, Carol, Alex, I see uh, Booker nodding. Uh, are we good to proceed with the I approval of the minutes? Acceptance of the minutes is submitted. Excellent. Second. Second. Roll call, Alex. Yes. Carol. Yes. Booker. Yes. Javier. Yes. Uh, uh, the minutes are approved. Uh, excellent. So we're going to move to public comment. Public comment is uh, at the time allocated for public comment is 30 minutes. Each person is has is going to have up to three minutes of comment and Booker is going to time that. Please, uh, if you have the updated version of Zoom, go to the lower part of your screen to reactions. If you click there, the feature to raise your hand is there. If you have an older version, just go to the right side of the screen. When you display the, the chat and participants, it's going to be the raise hand feature is going to be there. Um, I don't see hands. If I'm starting to see hands right now. <laughs> okay, cool. So we're going to start public uh, comment now. Uh, Robert Eastman. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so as you are setting out and kind of uh, designing some of these alternatives, I just wanted to uh, remind ourselves of some of the things that Rachel Bromberg mentioned in her presentation a couple of weeks ago. Um, someone asked how they measure the success of peer-led programs. And those criteria are questions like, do clients feel like they've been heard? The answer is yes, that's a data point. Are they feeling like they're being respected? Do they feel like the service is actually used for useful for them? Are they getting connected with adequate resources that are responsive to their needs? And are the resources being connected to the right resources? And I don't know, I guess I just, as you start to design the alternatives, I did, um, hope that there's some discussion of the ways in which we can measure safety. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share tonight, and I might actually feel a little more comfortable sharing this in an email, but I noticed that domestic violence is possibly on the agenda tonight. And I uh, just wanted to share kind of like a way that police can be involved in domestic violence that isn't always very obvious, um, which happened to someone that I really care about. Um, her partner threatened to call the police on her as uh, a, a tactic of abuse, I guess you could say. Um, and uh, it was really scary for her. He actually did end up calling her. Um, you know, there, the police said there was nothing they could do and it was fine. But the aftermath of that was that she was terrified to leave her house for several days, uh, for almost a week. And what really got her, <laughs> empowered her to finally like get out of the house was actually just being able to connect her with a therapist and a lawyer and anti-anxiety medication and just giving her the reassurance that those resources are out there and that, you know, if she chose to step out, she would be supported. Um, so that's my plug for peer-led alternatives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I'm looking for more hands. Uh, yeah, ping. Hello, um, thanks. Um, to piggyback on what Robert was just saying about values. Um, uh, yeah, I think it would be really great and maybe really important for the whole commission to come up with sort of criteria um, for what kind of alternatives are 
being proposed and um, <laughs> surprise, I, I'm all for peer led and um, agree with what Robert said about sort of heeding some of the advice that Rachel Bromberg gave. And I've also heard the committee talk about the Brattleboro report and got to look at that and think that they had some pretty clear criteria based off of the listening sessions with like 200 people and I forget however many organizations. And so I think looking at those um, and then also consulting Sean with the Wildflower Alliance, formerly the RLC for what criteria should be for organizations that get supported. and. Um, I wanted to uh, repeat some other Rachel Bromberg quotes just because I thought they were really helpful. Um, when she was talking about peer support values, um, she said the values are basically about meeting someone where they're at and having an interaction that is one person to another. It's not coming from a paternalistic place of, I know what's best for you, I'm going to tell you what to do. It's really from a place of respecting someone, respecting that they know what's best for them and helping them draw that out. It comes from a place of a strength-based perspective and recognizing that everyone has gotten to the place where they're at now because of the things they've experienced in their life. And they clearly have strengths and capacities and skills. That's how they've survived this long. So helping people find those strengths and capacities and skills. And I would say it's also really about respecting people's choices, respecting people's autonomy and not coercing people. Sometimes clinical interventions can be kind of manipulative in terms of, well, we want you to do this voluntarily, but if you don't do it voluntarily, we're going to make you do it anyway. So why don't we all just do this voluntarily and we won't have to call the police to come in and handcuff you, that kind of thing. And peer support is really about trying as much as possible to not coerce people in any way. It's really about helping people figure out what they need in this moment and providing that for them as much as possible and trusting people. When people say, this is what's helping for them, or this is what they need, or this is what's gonna help them get through today, trusting that and not thinking that you know better than them. Um, I'm probably out of time. There's like a whole nother paragraph that I thought was really great about what that looks like in organizations. And um, she seemed to have you know, experience and ideas for really implementing that in the, the structure of the organization. And so I think, um, evaluating whether or not organizations have integrated those principles into their decision-making structure and into their um, processes with every part of the organization would, um, you know, if the goal is to build the world we want to live in, which I think it is, it's such an inspiring, hopeful goal. And I think we can get there, you know, we don't have to fall short. Um, How your time has run out. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yaping. Um, Jose Adastra. Hi. Um, sort of adding to that, I think that it's a. I'm I'm pro peer led um, organization, and something that Rachel Bromberg said was really important is that there's the the peer support uh, workers and the uh, clinicians um, should have the same amount of input um, and the community, the, the decisions should be made as like a group and there shouldn't be like a, the high, what is it, a horizontal hierarchy. Um, and um, I think that's important. And I think um, it's important not to limit um, the ideas of alternatives um, to the police to just like alternative networks because I do think we should have another a, 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 an additional peer-led domestic violence support network um, with more shelters and more housing that we can send people you know um, when when they need support um, and if we have more resources actually in organizations that provide safe houses therapy and medical attention and whether that's short-term or long-term care then we'll be living up to the our community is safe and and like woke or whatever um because then we'll actually be providing survivors with this ability to recover and i think that we need to go beyond just providing a you know those networks and really implement a, a houselessness transition program. I think that we're really missing an opportunity to um, use a lot of our sort of empty flat space to make 
small structures for people to live in. And I think we need to go beyond an alternative network again and give people cash assistance and provide people health care on our dime. Um, what, what that's read the reparations from the police money let's get people into houses and some financial stability and get them the health care that they need um to get off the streets that's one of the most direct ways you can make up for the war on on poor people um in in my opinion so i think that we really need to and that should be another peer-led thing but like i think that we really need to go by the principle of having the peer support workers like you know, consult like Sean from the Wildflower Alliance because they're familiar with the training people should have. Um, and so, yeah, I think we have the resources here, especially if we view this money as pilot money and, and, and go further next time. Like, oh, we started all this stuff this time. Look at how well it's going. And, and it's not even like it would be the first time this stuff happens. It, it, it happens elsewhere and it works really well. So, you know, I think that we should, that, that's sort of all the angles that I would like to approach it from. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, let me cough in. Hi, um, I just wanted to speak, thanks everyone who's shared so far. And I just wanted to speak to like um, the sort of structural issues you all are facing in terms of the government and like the government um the city government not really having a house like I feel like if you look at the human services part of the administrative code it's like uh not very comprehensive and I think we really just need a new department to house all the things that we were talking about or that some folks talked about um prior to this and I think um if you look at like nationally where people are moving and where people are going a new department is clear and i think providing recommendations um, to the city council as soon as possible about new infrastructure in the city to hold accountable programs and really emphasizing accountability um i think there's this like idea that this is like this unsolvable problem that we like can't figure out and i think people have figured it out um there have been movements and activists for decades who have operated outside of the police and been um, really successful at supporting communities and I think we can listen to those folks. Um, there's a resource in the, I think we sent you this <laughs> big long document, but there's like from the bottom up, which is this, uh, which is like looking at different membership based organizations and they talk about a lot about accountability structures. Um, so that's all to say it's just going to take a lot of thinking outside of the box to create this infrastructure. Um, and I think we need really like thoughtful, big changes to some of the infrastructure. And um, the city like has been putting up a lot of barriers to that, which has been disappointing. And I think it's gonna be on you all to provide a really comprehensive um, new department outline um, to make something like this happen and, and to make accountability happen. Um, because even in organizations like ServiceNet and CSO, like there aren't accountability structures. And so, um, as the sort of municipal government, you have opportunities to do that. And I just think this is like a really beautiful opportunity. And I hope that you all, in addition to looking to programs, you're looking at like what city infrastructure can house these programs. And like the mayor and the city solicitor, I feel like are gonna say that it's not possible, but like it is possible. The mayor just needs to create an administrative code that says this is a new department. Um, and that's, that's all he has to do. So I think I just wanted to like say that. Um, and yeah, as a social worker, like, I think, um, I just believe that we need city infrastructure to house this stuff in accountable ways. So thanks. Thank you so much, Lemmy. <clears throat> uh, next person, Rai Buckley. Hello. I'd like to urge this commission um, to pursue consensus. I think that if the final report of this commission does not reflect at least a valiant attempt to achieve consensus, it will create no change. Historically, commissions have been used to slow, moderate, and prevent change. This was true during the British colonial occupation of India, the civil rights movement, and when my college administration tried to de deny survivors of sexual assault protection and support by creating a commission um, 
they would continue until most of the student leaders had graduated. The community of Northampton and of America has demanded change. You all have been chosen to investigate the data available and to represent the voices of our community members who are demanding change. To create a final report that merely lists the process and the differing opinions of this commission will further empower the mayor and city councilors' desire to make no serious change and will further disempower those underrepresented voices that have been you have been tasked with representing. As was voiced by several commissioners yesterday and by numerous community members throughout this process, this change cannot wait. We must immediately provide our community members with services that provide them with real help and create real safety and do not actively harm them. This commission has a rare opportunity and an opportunity that can be wasted if we do not create a powerful report. I know you all are working incredibly hard and I would hate to see all of this work go to waste and for none of the numerous problems you've identified to be fixed and for none of the solutions that you have rigorously explored and chosen for our community to be implemented. Um, I just really want to urge you as a commission to create a final document um, that will create change because this has been this has been a powerful and rigorous process and this is a rare opportunity. Um, that is all. Thank you very much for all the work you do. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, is there anybody else um, that would like to speak during this time of public speaking? I would like to speak. Uh, this is Jessica Telly if nobody else has spoken. Oh, of course. Go ahead. Okay. I mean, if no one else has left to speak. Um, I apologize for joining late. I was just on a debrief meeting for my organization. Um, my name is Jess Tilly. I live here in Northampton, Mass. Um, I've lived here on and off over the past 25 years for a total of about 14 years. Um, highly involved in community organization for the past 25 years, specifically in the realm of harm reduction. Um, I myself identify as a person with lived experience and when I moved back to this area, I, I just got to ask, how long do I have to speak? You know, you have two minutes and 15 seconds left. Oh, okay. Let me make this a lot shorter then. When I moved back to the area, um, I was leaving my position working for Department of Public Health in Boston and was appalled at the lack of social services um, that were actually working for members of the marginalized community in this area. Um, I'm formed a small 501c3 with Albert Park, who is a therapist, and we work specifically with people who use drugs that have been severely, severely left out of um, social services in this area. Although it may seem like we have ServiceNet, um, other organizations, Tapestry, they really, the people we are, we have outreach teams, and we formed an organization called HRH 413, um, which oversees six outreach teams in Hampshire County. Uh, we constantly receive reports about our participants being abused by uh, organizations such as DART, ServiceNet continuously being denied the basic of human services. Um, in fact, we just got a report back two nights ago about an individual who had just been released from Hampshire County Correctional and was denied services, even the basic things like getting a sleeping bag. Um, he was about to have himself rearrested. He was going to commit a crime so that he wouldn't freeze to death. Um, to me, that's disgusting. That should not be happening in a town that is so prosperous as Northampton. Um, we don't have adequate shelters. Um, we don't even have adequate syringe service programs. Um, we are a small organization. We are peer led. Uh, we have been, we only hire people with lived experience. Um, we do all our own organizing, and we also run an outreach team for uh, people who cannot or will not call 911, even though we do have the Good Samaritan Law. The police have continuously harassed and arrested people, um, specifically single mothers who end up losing their housing, lose their children if they have somebody who's in the house that's using, even though they did the right thing by calling 911. So we respond to those overdoses. Um, and we also distribute Narcan. I just That's did our yearly our report. Time is up. Okay. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, 
I just I just want to note something. Um, I mean, I think that, I mean, it's with the speakers that were today, I think would be um good maybe to. To, uh, speaking by myself, this is something that we would need to discuss. To have Jessica maybe speaking to us in a different port, a little more in the different portion of this meeting, but also, I think it would be really useful to have her speaking to the entire commission. To the entire commission. Um, I, I mean, I was unaware of a lot of things that she's talking about, and I think it's extremely necessary to hear those. So, um, in some. And item number five, we may in four and five, we may we can pluck her a little bit more to try to figure it out that and also to get more information. Is that okay with you guys? Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm pass the baton to Booker. Thank you. Um, and and by the way, Jessica, I hope you stay because I think you do have some rather important things to say. Uh, we have not yet talked enough about harm reduction programs and substance abuse treatment alternatives um, within this committee. Um, I'm sorry that I missed the meeting um, yesterday. I spent a lot of time today watching um, the recording of last night's meeting. It's, I have to say it's one of the most intense meetings I've watched. Um, there's a part of me that I was, I was glad I wasn't there and I could instead experience it from a part. Um, we actually have as our next agenda item we were actually supposed to talk about a discussion on the interim report and discussion from the city council meeting. The reason I put this on the agenda was I had feelings about what it felt like. Dan did an absolutely marvelous job presenting his um, our, the report that he put together to the city council. Um, uh, I don't know if any of the rest of you got to watch that meeting. Alex, of course, was there. Um, um, and I guess I was sort of curious to hear if people had comments about how the report seemed to fly at that city council meeting. I'm gonna go ahead. <laughs> Please. Um, so I was in there, and um, and but but I, you know, I I just want to refer to to our portion of the report, right? Which is something that I can sort of talk with some level of three. Um, and and, and it's really contrasting with what happened yesterday. But referring to our portion, I feel that the conversations that we had had the issues that we have spotted and the way how we have approached every single of those issues, I feel really proud of it. Um, I think we had been able to reach consensus and about the important, the, the different really important things that they need to change. And and we came a long, a long way. And we, when we have talked, uh, have really thoughtful conversations and I feel proud of that. I feel proud of what this subcommittee uh, created as our contribution to the to the full report. Um, I have a ton of time to watch the the city council meeting with Dan presenting, but um, Dan is somebody that I trust, and um, hopefully I'm going to be able to watch it. But I I just want to say that I'm pretty proud of the work that we're doing and that I will be pushing for us to reach consensus because I feel that our subcommittee is extremely clear where we're going to go and how we're going to do it. Thank you, Javier. Are there other comments? Carol, please. Yeah, similarly, I was not present. Uh, I did read the account in the Gazette of, um, you know, that which included the, the chief's reaction. And I, like Javier, I felt really solid about the fact that we were even having a reaction from the, from the chief that said, yeah, it would really would be helpful to have other people involved besides police on the mental health crisis. 
responses. And so, again, I think we we have tried to stay close in this process to generating, getting to the point where we can generate specific primary goals, some of them aspirational, but stay with them. They're working in other cities. Um, and, you know, very specific, instead of saying how it should work once, once there's a transition away from policing, um, we are citing the model programs and exploring those and of course they have to be adapted to this context but um yeah like javier i feel good about the portion that we wrote i felt kind of bad after reading the gazette article that um there seemed to be you know the the chief seemed to be going after um the committee that looked at some budget stuff it tried that they tried to discern the hours the unexplained hours that were paid for within within the police force and you know it for me what that brought brought for me i felt bad for the people who had spent so much time generating the that data putting it into pie graphs etc to illustrate their point and then just being shot down by you know by um the chief it it said to me again that sometimes before we go public with things we do need to discern by checking in you know, when we do our analysis and we're about to present our analysis, let's not set ourselves up um, by not touching base with someone who can clarify the bizarre, the biz bizarre in this case, the bizarre discrepancy between what got paid for in the way of work hours and how many hours got turned in on timesheets. You know, I mean, I, I know there's been hesitation to to talk with the police or bring them in, but it, it seems to me that we are going to be more effective if we go with really bold suggestions to the city, if we can just find out whether whether we can um, implement any of them. So that's that's sort of what's going on for me. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. Alex. Yeah, thank you. Um, Yes, obviously I was there. Um, I thought it was well received. I was proud of our part of the report as well, um, despite our all our technical difficulties uh, in in assembling it. Um, I think it was powerful, especially with Booker's edition. And and um, I I had heard, I received feedback that there are many people who just really appreciated uh, that framing that you added, Booker. Um, <clears throat> And I think, you know, the, so I'm, I'm, I feel excited about our next steps here. Um, the I, one note, you know, the sort of the question that the city council president had um, that, that was basically about, uh, you know, have you, uh, <clears throat> have you talked to the police directly? And um, so I just want to push us and we can talk about this in the next one to, to schedule uh, the chief to come talk with us and, and, you know, we'll, we're not expecting a, uh, we won't expect agreement, but we, it will probably be very helpful in terms of, uh, of facts as far as what, you know, there are certain ways where there are laws, state laws that require certain things. Um, and we need to make sure that, that, you know, even if we want those to change, we we won't, as a city won't have the power to change them um, right away. Uh, so we we need to be aware of those so that we know what our what our hurdles are um, in achieving uh, certain things. And um, yeah, I've definitely heard uh, that that you know I think the police w w are in favor of uh, assistance. Uh, I think where where we'll get the sticking point will be. Um, when we d want to take more money away from policing and add it to uh, other services, um, <clears throat> but that you know that that can be a phased process where where we bring online um, the the next the, the the alternatives and then we reduce um, the the funding uh, when well, when those things are online. So <clears throat> that's um, but we you know I'm I'm excited to to lay out that that phased approach. Uh, and and look and see what you know. What can we 
and especially what can we accomplish in the first year. So um, yeah, I'm just ready to work, work more on it. That's about it. Thank you so much, Alex. So part of the reason I put this on is um, um, I was a little underwhelmed by the response of the city council to the, I was watching it real time. Um, and um, I was a little concerned that the city council was nowhere I guess I'm asking Alex or maybe others for a reality check here. I felt that there's a huge difference between where what we presented and where the city council was prepared to go. Um, and maybe that's what happens with these kinds of things. And I guess I'm looking for a reality check about that. Because um, um, I think we presented a pretty measured... <laughs> To use uh, David Hoos's towards low-hanging fruit kind of presentation, um, we were nowhere close to an abolish kind of format, and I felt like it was going to be a stretch for the city council even to think about what was presented. Um, and I, I guess I'm really asking you, Alex, am I seeing more than what I should be seeing, or? Is this the way uh, the council might hear things on an early view? Um, well, I can't really <laughs> speak for <laughs> the other members of the council, um, but I can speak for kind of the culture of the council, which is, uh, it's not an easy place to be. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's uh, yeah, it's kind of a, <clears throat> Um, I think people are, are af afraid of uh, stepping out on a limb too much. And so there's going to be kind of a conservative reaction is, is often the default reaction. Okay. Um, and that is uh, not to say that, you know, with, with a, a strong report and with um, actual discussion about what it looks like and what it might mean um, that that will uh, move forward. I mean, I know that you know Michael Quinlan and I are are uh, you know very <clears throat> much with the, this idea, um, and I think there are others on the council who would who would be happy to support it. You know, most of the, however, what we what we will do as a council primarily will be to approve any changes that the mayor proposes. So, you know, if we're, if, if we're going to recommend, let's start a new department, um, the city council has to approve that administrative code. And um, I think that it, it would, um, and then also the budget for that. Um, <clears throat> but so in a way, you know, I, I, I would, what I'm most worried about is is how the mayor will receive our report and um, how how that might move move forward or not. Because if the mayor does nothing, all we can do is is reduce um, funding for something, and and, and uh, with, you know as we know we can't reallocate it. And I I hope that that what we recommend uh, becomes part of the uh, election platform of of anyone who's planning you know going to run for mayor um that the that the, this will be a this will be uh i hope at least we have one i, mean, I hope we have many candidates who will want to support our work and we, we need to think of it also in that context that um especially you know, like this mayor can decide the, the following year but um but after that it will be up to the new mayor so um yeah those are just some some reflections. I hope that's helpful. That was, thank you so much, Alex. And I, I'm, I'm sorry. I know I gave you a really difficult thing to talk about there. And I think you, what I was really concerned about is, and I think you've answered the question. I was concerned about whether we needed to think about reframing what we submitted in order to work well. But I, I'm going to stay with what you just said. I think 
delivering a strong report is the way to go. Are there any other um, discussion about this? Carol, it looks like you would want to say something else. No, I guess this is a question to Alex um, about <clears throat> the culture. I mean, one of the, one of the traps here is that we, no matter how sound our report is and how well documented, in how this it how it would work to move towards peer led uh, services, and and how it would strengthen community, no matter how strong we are. You know, I guess the question is, do you see anything, Alex? Without naming people on the council, you see any anybody who can get into seeing the value of creating a platform for moving away from retribution, you know, because that's more philosophic than 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 budget, you know, take from the the police and and give it over here, you know, we can just fall into that trap of having people divide themselves because you know some portion of one department's budget is going to be taken away permanently and reallocated but on a philosophic level do you can you think of anybody in the council or the mayor's office who who can really subscribe to working to create a platform for moving away from retribution uh, you know and you know really moving a little bit more towards restorative concepts um i think it's getting too far into conjecture. Okay. Uh, All right. That's fair. But, um, That's fair. But uh, but no, I, I do think that you know the if we look at the reports that the mayor's office has commissioned, um, we see how like the the pan, panhandling support um, panhandling report. It all it's all about things to support people, um, and or majority of it is. And it doesn't mean that those things uh, have been re realized, but but the, you know this is the, the these are the um, these are the recommendations. And I think that, for example, you know we see in the creation of the resilient uh, resilience hub, which is something that you know Mayor Narkowitz has said, it, it he wants this to be part of his legacy is that this is created. Um, and that is all about being supportive. So, you know, there's certainly, uh, I, so I think there's support and where the challenge will be is probably going to be about money. Um, and uh, that, I'm just not sure where, where the mayor is going to land on that. And, um, you know, I think we have some convincing arguments around you know, creating a mental that that creating a mental health crisis response could be done for a city of our size um, with you know half the money that that was cut from the police budget last year. Um, so, you know, there's 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 some some promising uh, possibilities. That's probably all I can say say to that. But the the general idea, you know, given the the comments of many, even those who voted against the budget cut in June, talked about how they wanted, um, you know, if there was a plan, they were would have been supportive. And so um, that that gives me hope that there will be general support for when there is a plan uh, for for this this change. Okay, thanks. Javier. So here comes the third question to put you in the spot, Alex. Well, <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, I'm not gonna answer the question. It's just a, a statement. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad, Booker, that you watched yesterday's meeting because, you know, what we're talking here, it's, it's a systemic issue. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of city councils in, in, in the Commonwealth in Springfield, in Hampton. And I'm conscious, for example, that the work that I have been able to do in places like Springfield, uh, the changes that we have been able to do in Springfield would never have been possible if the city council looked like the people that they represent, which was not like that five years ago or in even more. And that's where we, that's what we have here. Um, that that's an issue by itself 
It's the same issue with the with the commission that we were talking yesterday. Uh, at the end, the commission looks like Northampton. It looks like, you know, it generated the conditions of participation as the same way how Northampton creates the conditions for, at the end, who you're going to see or, or hanging out or spending time or spending money in downtown Northampton. I think there's a, there's a correlation. It's it's not it's not a it's not an accident. And if we had a city council that looked more like people who are being affected for what we're discussing, I'm pretty sure we we not necessarily would have a, this kind of conversation, right? Um, yesterday, one of the statements that I did before Joyce read the quote from Martin Luther King, which was beautiful was um we are asking uh, was how anybody can understand for what people are going with police encounters with being harassed by police living in a system of oppression where enforcement functions as a social uh enforcement they can they can't i mean i i can ask you to use your imagination it's the same if somebody has never uh be like uh, feel a starvation in their life because there's no money for food. It's hard to explain that, right? Um, I know about that. Uh, it's, it's hard to explain to somebody who's white what, what does it feel when you get pulled over by a cop and you know that you, even, even if you want to be nice and make things go faster and reach out to your glove compartment, to give your registration and everything, you know you cannot do it because you're not white. Because your skin color is going to get you in trouble if you do that. How you explain that to a predominantly city council who is white, to a predominantly commission that's white? So because of those experiences, it's extremely difficult to make people understand about the urgency of these matters. It's extremely difficult to make people understand that things cannot wait. Many times we're talking about uh, somebody yesterday in the public comment mentions about hiring, rehiring cops, making some, I have here notes, uh, uh, other kind of training. And I said it yesterday. How many times me and other people of color in the commission has to say, it's factual information that anti-bias and, 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 and conscious bias training doesn't work. We have talk and talk and talk about that. Um, I'm just saying this because I'm, I'm not surprised that what, what we talk about, we talked last uh, yesterday, which was, for me was, was, was sort of depressing in the same way <laughs> oh, for Booker was sort of, sort of, depressing seeing the reaction of the city council for me it was depressing to see yesterday how we we would be willing not to present something that is probably something that is going to affect people for real accountability has to be part of it when we're talking about i i, I wouldn't carol say that we are taking away money from the cops if we, if if we go with the recommendations of peer led organizations they are going to be mental health services, DV and sex abuse service uh, issues, uh, including what uh, who's want, which is you know take away traffic related things to the police. How the police department would justify to keep the same budget if they are not having that? So it's a reallocation of money. You're not taking money from anybody. You're just reallocating and being conscious of your budget. So we have to go away from the sense of oh we cannot take away money. No, what we're doing is that we're deciding there are services that no need somebody who participates in a systemic racist organization. And also that service needs to be done by somebody without a gun. Call it a school resource officer. That's a cop with a gun in a school. We can, you know, we can put it any name, but that is it. If we're not doing that, why we should keep that money there. We should move it to where that service is actually done. So I, all this, what I'm saying is just to encourage you, and, and I like what you said, Booker, that uh, rather than trying to get to a middle point to please the mayor or the city council, we have to do what we have to do. We have to recommend what is needed. 
We have to we have to be a reflection because we cannot in one minute uh, talk for 30 minutes yesterday about the lack of voices of color of female voices of color in the in here. And you know what I'm thinking after the 30 minutes? Yeah, some of you some of people in the commission wants those bosses just not to listen to them because the other because the other people of color in the commission are telling them and that people of color are not being paid attention. So why do you want more people of color and diversity in the commission if you're already not paying attention to those of color in the commission who are telling you what's going on? And that was my therapy moment for you guys. And hopefully, you know, hopefully we're going to keep talking about this, but I really want you to think about what I'm saying. Thanks. Thank you so much, Javier. And um, I put this on as a 15 minute discussion. We've done a little bit more than that, but I think these are really important discussions. I want to move now on now to our next agenda item, which was about invited speakers. Um, and I want to pay attention to Jessica, who I hope is still, um, uh, Jessica appears to still be here. I would personally like to, uh, like to invite Jessica, because I think we need a voice to talk about other ways to talk about an approach to substance abuse management um, and peer-led substance abuse management. Um, Jessica, you're not supposed to speak now, but I want to ask, would you be willing to come back and meet with us as an invited speaker? Oh, <clears throat> absolutely. And I apologize. I, <laughs> I'd forgotten the three minute time limit and I was trying to get everything in there. And honestly, I'd need a good at least 15 minutes to give a background about what we've been seeing over the past three years and, you know, our experience, and when I say experience, I'm talking about our organization um, as well as the community that we serve. I think, you know, keeping over, I think we have about 32 months worth of documented report backs from, um, you know, people who are houseless. Um, I mean, we even work with sex workers over in this town and uh, people who use drugs mental health, uh, I'd like to be able to share some of those reports. And, you know, not all are negative, um, but it's becoming alarmingly clear how disproportionate the, the services that are needed that are actually being provided. Um, there's a lot of self-congratulatory behavior that I witness. I, I should mention too, and then I, I swear I'll stop talking, that I sit on the, or yeah, I sit on the opioid task force for Hampshire County. So I have an inside view of what is actually happening, um, so, you know, since, so. So with the permission of the rest of the, of the alternatives committee, I want to personally invite you to have a 15 minute presentation with us. Um, I will need to get back to you later about what the date and the time of that would be. Um, what I would like that, and I'm about to invite the other uh, members of this committee to say what they would like to hear from you about, but um, I'm specifically interested in hearing about um, how other harm reduction techniques might be a useful alternative to policing that the city could offer. Um, that's one thing I would like to hear about. Are there other things that you would like to have Jessica talk with us about? Alex? Um, yeah, I just want to second uh, inviting inviting Jessica. And, uh, you know, before the pandemic, uh, Albert Alby uh, invited me to a um, harm reduction meeting, and I got to sit and witness that and uh, felt like it was very powerful. Um, <clears throat> And so I'm be very excited to, to, to put this in. So as, as far as um, specific things to talk about, I mean, I think you mentioned, uh, yeah, how, how in the, the, the ecosystem of substance use um, providers uh, can harm reduction fit in? How can that be expanded? I mean, my, in my view um, and yeah, what, what kind of recommendations um, can we make so that 
That, that's my view. Okay. Uh, Carol or Javier, or Carol, please. Okay. Yeah, I would love uh, to hear your perspective on um, how harm reduction, I mean, my opinion is harm reduction is not a radical concept. It's a human concept. It's a sensible concept. And, you know, it's a collaboration, the kind of collaborations where we want to look for. Um, I, I see harm reduction being used in terms of housing first programs. I mean, if you have any sort of anecdotes that you can share with us about outcomes when people have gone through harm reduction oriented programming and they've gotten finally they're off the street they're in a house and they may not have quit their substance but they are in a position to organize their lives a little bit better and gives them a platform for any kind of recovery you know any any kind of anecdotes that we could ultimately really insert into our report i think would be helpful because you know i'm a believer in um expanding harm reduction programs in this town and you know with all not just getting people to reduce their substance or use it in ways safer ways but also the housing issue i think is very very tied in there too so oh, i'm a i'm a huge proponent of housing first model and yeah. and you're in luck because i just wrote a interim report and it's all anecdotal Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's what that would be so helpful for us. Yeah. You're doing, a great job of, you're doing a great job of marketing what you're going to bring us. Thank you so much. Uh, Javier. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, two things. The first one is uh, power reduction, uh, I think would be extremely important. I know that Alex has looked a lot into it and, and you know, uh, Javier, can you say that word again? Harm reduction. reduction. Harm reduction. Harm. Okay, sorry, I just didn't hear hear that. So, right. hold on. Let me... So I think that would be great. Um, also, one of the things that uh, you mentioned, Jessica, that is self congratulatory, uh, and I would add self congratulatory um, culture in our Hampton. I, I yesterday, I, it's funny. Yesterday, I mentioned this. Um, I think it's good to have a perspective of somebody who is actually into. Uh, do, into the community doing this um, and get really concerned of, uh, and I'm going to say it again just for the record, uh, of organizations with self-interest into preserving this uh, pervasive system without a, a organization without accountability and organizations that pretty much they base their existence is we have been here for 10 years, so why to change? And I think that's a red flag. Uh, an organization giving services to the community without a feedback loop or without accountability, it's dangerous. And I would I would even say that for peer led. If it, but w uh, we know that peer led has a extremely transparent feedback loop, and that's one of the reasons why I'm pushing for it because I feel that when we're talking about accountability, accountability is doesn't only work for for police and others, but also for service providers. Uh, I'm the kind of person that I don't take face value what I'm being told because I want to really know what's going on. Um, and I do feel that having Jessica come and talk to us uh, as much as she can preserving sort of privacy and confidentiality would be fantastic. So thank, I wanna, I'm now gonna wanna move to, on to other invited speakers. Jessica, if you wouldn't mind chat um sending either me or javier a personal chat with your email or contact information um so that we have a way to get back to you because i'm not sure yet we have decided without doing a formal vote that we are going to invite you in to be a formal speaker what we have we have to work on is the date and the time and when we will do this and i can't give you that yet all right okay i'll throw it up in there Thank you so thank you so much um, for what you're offering us. And thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to. And again, I apologize for the the quick and dirty three minutes there. Um, it'll be better prepared next time. Okay, very good. Um, I now want to find out: Are there other? I, I'm gonna. There's a part of me that wants to go straight to Alex's suggestion of inviting Chief Casper. 
Um, I also want to, I'm aware that at yet last night's meeting, there was also a thought of Chief Casper being invited to the larger um, meeting, to the larger group. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that aside for a moment. Um, as I was watching the recording, I got the email that Lois Ahrens is retiring from the committee, uh, which thoroughly bummed me out. Um, and partially as a way of responding to what she said last night, um, I want to specifically ask who should we invite to come meet with us about domestic violence alternative programs? Alex. Um, so actually, Elisa Klein helped me quite a bit in the writing of um, the domestic, domestic violence section. I'm not sure if I, I can reach out there. It sounds like people have reached out to her and she has not um, responded. So I can try to reach out and see if she would come to speak with us. Um, the, uh, but uh, someone from Safe Passage. Um, let's see, actually, I'm trying to find our, because in our further work in the report, we list. Uh, so Alex, I just want to flag a, a message that Dan sent to the Zoom chat. He says that the chief is being invited to the poli policies and spending subcommittee, not to the entire commission. One thing that we can do, if that's okay with you guys, uh, we can do a joint uh, meeting with them. I mean, I, I had been talking about possible joint meetings of subcommittees for a while. So if that's an option. Um, also, Sorry, um, I thought we were talking about the police the chief. Booker's question was about domestic ah, yeah, violence. No, I was talking about yeah. police so, chief. So if Dan, I know Dan is on the meeting and I just saw the ch what the chat that he put in. Um, let's come back to that discussion. Let's stay with domestic violence just for um, a moment or two and then we can address how we how the meeting with the chief might occur. Okay. So I'm sorry, Alex, keep going. So I know uh, I've also been corresponding with Alyssa about this. I'm sure we can invite somebody and if uh, somebody from safe passage and leadership there to come meet with us. Um, based on what I've learned from discussions that have gone on is whether we also, I think we also may want to invite someone from a, one of the more peer led organizations. Um, and I guess I would probably seek out uh, either you or I or someone else could seek out with Alyssa who might that might rep be. She has sent me some names. Um, um, I guess what I'm asking for is the committee thought about should we only have somebody from Safe Passage or should we have someone that both represents Safe Passage and an alternative, an alternative to that alternative as a way of dealing with um, domestic. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to say Alex first and then Javier. Uh, yes, I absolutely support that. Uh, so having having someone from Safe Passage and someone from a, a peer led, if, if we can find that and if anyone who's uh, here has those connections as well. We would love to hear them. Oh. <laughs> Javier? Um, I would, uh, so in relation to inviting, I mean, I think we have to invite more than just safe passage because that's one model, right? Which is actually already working within the city. Uh, I would say in general terms, maybe the Grace House would be a good one, but something that we would need to look more into it.
just curious, Carol, do you have any thoughts about this? Uh, well, I'm thinking Nelquid. I'm thinking for sexual assault, if we want to roll that into the um, Center for Women and Community. Um, that's fairly peer led. Um, that covers Hampshire County. There's a hot there, you know, that just a, it's a different model. Um, you know, it's more a compliment and support rather than sheltering. Um, so the, the, those are the only things on my mind. You know, Nelquid, I haven't followed Nelquid in recent years when they first started out, they were very peer led. Um, whether their model has, you know, bureaucratized, I don't know. Would someone like, um, but I, I'll contact somebody if you want me to, well, you know, here's what I want to, that, that's what I was about to ask is somebody willing to volunteer to, uh, court the possibilities. I think what we would like it, I'm about to say what I feel like I'm hearing, mm -hmm. uh, we need to have someone from Safe Passage speak with us because they are at the moment a one of the default services and they're actually named on the policing website as who they partner with for domestic violence calls. So we need to hear about that. Um, I think we, I would also like to hear about some peer support programs. Mm -hmm also um you know and my guess is if we had more than it's going to be hard if we have more than two different speakers so having someone from safe passage and someone from a peer support program what i would like to find out is if one of you would be willing to volunteer to come up with these two individuals um if i were doing if all of you said no i'm not going to do it i would try to contact somebody to say passage and I would call Alyssa Klein and say, tell me who you think I ought to call for this. Um, Javier? I can volunteer to it. I mean, I, um, I know really well the co-director of Nelquid because I have worked with her a lot. Okay. Uh -huh. and, I, and I have work in my immigration war has mm -hmm. overlap with a lot of the safe passage. So I have worked with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jessica just wrote in the chat a Stonewall project at UMass. So I'm uh, going gonna, so I'm gonna uh -huh. to make a list and I'm going to try to see because, you know, if mm -hmm. whoever would be a viable and would be a poll of like diverse poll to go, come to talk to us. Because having somebody from Stonewall would bring the trans trans uh, community into this bigger discussion. So, so Javier, can may I, may I write down that you're taking yes. uh, charge of this? Okay. Yep. And also I can talk to Alisa Klein. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts about that? Okay. Um, the other potential speaking issues. I'm I'm purposely skipping the police uh, and, and uh, asking for the chief police chief. Um, we also have down as possible other things to talk about are community-based policing, restorative justice, um, and impacts of employment. Are there speakers? Um, I've got to say the thing that bubbles for me is thinking about speakers who can talk to us about restorative justice. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm, that's my own personal interest. Are there, of those other topics, are there other speakers that any of you think we should be working on bringing into the talking to us. Alex. Um, I can second the restorative justice uh, just because we need to provide an alternative to the, the program that the po police department is currently moving forward on, which we see uh, is, is much too based in that system um, for many people to, uh, and we talk about this a little bit in the report, um, I don't remember where it was, but that, uh, you know, that that's not, not, not within the best practices of the restorative justice movement. So, so I think it's important that in our, in our report, we talk about uh, what, what we think the best practices 
should they and and um so i don't know who that is but thank you alex javier yeah i do agree with alex and was lois was one of the people who mentioned that to take a look to the website of the organization that uh the city of east hampton northampton and i think one more it's using which is heavily attached to the police to the policing system and heavily white so i think it's a great idea but also i, I want to just address that uh we're looking into restorative justice without being tied to the police department right as this organization that they are using now that uh, it's heavily tied with the police system and police department. And I say that because they have former police officers uh, being part of their board. It's it's something that, uh, for me at least, was really disturbing when I would start sort of going through their website. No, I, I agree with you, Javier. Everything, I thought it was neat that the Northampton police were getting involved with it. That's why I started reading about what is restorative justice and the police should have absolutely zero role in it. So um it, it sounds like a really good idea until you think about it or learn about it so I, I think we need to do something um cynthia has placed something in the chat cynthia swaps this, um about linda baker is an excellent resource on restorative justice she lives in northampton um um perhaps i could contact get in touch with Cynthia and see if we can pursue that in a different way. Is there, do one of you want to volunteer to do that or um, shall I get in touch with Cynthia for that? It's okay for you to say, Booker, would you please do that? No, I'd like to talk with uh, Cynthia first and yeah, be happy to do that. Thank you, Carol. Okay, sure. Um, I would point out just to have it on record that any kind of, from my point of view, my personal point of view, any kind of this restorative justice or talking about race or whatever has to be POC led. I just, just want to put that because, you know, uh, if not, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, you cannot explain and talk about oppression and about moving forward without having experienced oppression. And knowing what, how hard or noise to move forward and make amendments, and that's you know for as much awakened people feel. Um, I don't know. That's my that's are my two cents. I don't know how to. I, Javier, I actually secretly agree with you. Um, the reason I'm saying secretly is everything I've read about um, restorative justice. It's very community based, and it's like. You almost have to live within half a mile of the person who's seeking the help for it to work. So it's a really, all of the really great programs. I just sort of, I've probably because I'm not in a community where I sort of see how would I do this if I was involved. Um, and, and again, it's as you would say, it's my privilege. So I have other resources that I can call on. So, but I sort of have a hard time imagining how that might happen in Northampton. But that's why I think we need the, the public comment who to bring us examples of day-to-day -day restorative justice that's going on around yeah. here. Yeah, and, and I think that's also lines up with, um, and again, I'm glad that you watched the meeting just there because I'm referring to the meeting, um, us doing homework, right? Um, going and they start taking a look to it and you know i appreciate yapping sending all those cheat cheat that she always send in articles uh but i think that we also need to go out of our way to start getting information i mean so for example in amherst there is an incredible woman called barbara love who dr love does a lot in relation to racial and uh implicit bias when i was working in the school system in northampton she did a wonderful training it's an african-american woman outspoken clear concise so it would start sort of looking around we're going to be able to find more likely uh these people who are you know who are not necessarily up front there because you know they have we live <laughs> we live in a community that it's if you're white and you have been here for 30 40 years that's enough for you to be at center of what you're doing and I think that this is give us the opportunity to be able to go and look for people like Barbara Love and others 
to be able to to put them in the center of this because they are the expert. Okay. Are there, if there aren't other potential speakers we want to talk about, I want to move to talking about speaking with Jody Casper. Um, and I'm thinking about how to format this. Um, thank you, Dan, um, for letting us know that she, um, the chief is being invited to the police and spending subcommittee. Um, I did also listen on, on the meeting yesterday about thinking about should committee subcommittees be doing things together? Should we be sending questions um, so that one committee is speaking to people? Um, I want to take about seven to 10 minutes talking about do we want, how would we like to communicate with Chief Casper? Would, should we be there on the Zoom meeting or do we want to? I, I just want to hear ideas. I, I'm assuming we all think we need to meet with Chief Casper. Um, and if I'm wrong about that, let me know. But the question is, is how, what format do we want to have that occur in? Alex. Um, well, I appreciated the, the format that the policies and services uh, committee came up with, which was to brainstorm questions and, and send them to the chief um, and then have her come and answer them. And of course, you know, we could ask follow up questions and such. So that's one option. Um, the other is just for us to come up with the questions that we individually want um, answered and we may, you know, may not get uh, the, uh, if we don't send them ahead of time, we're not necessarily going to have fully prepared answers, but um, in, in term, yeah. Um, I, um, but I guess that's all I have to say right there. Carol. Yeah, I, I agree with, you know, generating some specific questions ahead of time. But, you know, I sort of have a feeling that um, that we should invite her to come to our subcommittee too, separate. Um, there's, there's plenty of overlap between the work of the subcommittees, but I think I would really love to sort of suss out, not that I'm looking, for, not, I want to be really clear, not looking for permission or validation from from the chief for what we end up recommending um but i but i do there's a politic around this that you know i want us to be effective i would like to have change in the city and that it that it gets adopted and it and it's sustainable um and so i want to be effective and part of that is when i'm doing organizing in the past, I like to see, you know, I, I like to discern what's the reaction of the institutional figure who is going to be deeply affected by what we come up with if it actually is adopted by the city. And so in light of that, I would like the alternatives subcommittee with our um, push towards getting away from retribution, getting moving this city and this whole idea of public health and public safety more towards community-based uh, initiatives. And, you know, I'd just like to interview her at our subcommittee rather than just submitting questions and getting written answers. Thank you. Javier. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think would be useful. I mean, the approach would be totally different. So making now that after Carol talk, I feel that, yeah, our question would be different. Our approach is different. The, the way how the, you know, we run this meeting and the topics that we have are different. So we need a separated space for that. That's for sure. I agree with that. Uh, and I think we should do it. In a footnote, I would say I, I and I have said this from day one, uh, you know, it's not that I'm going to believe whatever they say. I just want to hear their narrative. 
But in the same way how, uh, Carol, you said you want to see the reaction of the, you know, the person in charge of the police department of these changes, um, I think at least I'm going to sort of push a little back to that idea. Because if, if you're the head of the department and they want to take away money from you, I already know. I mean, I, I could be any department and I already know the reaction. That's one thing. But the other is... I and, I, and 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 I mean this with utmost respect because I it's something that I have been thinking for a while. I prefer to think, rather than thinking how the head of the police department uh, uh, is going to feel about what we're proposing, I prefer to think how people in affected communities are going to feel if we're able to make those changes. And I think that's a more powerful way to see it. Um, I respect uh, Chief Casper as a human being, but my concern doesn't is not placed in how she feels or not about us relocating money for, by the way, services that they are not going to give anymore. So talking about budget. Um, I'm more concerned in my thoughts, in my hope, is more it's better placed with the people that if we come out with a strong uh, report and suggestions and advice, it's going to be affecting in their lives. I think that's way more, for me, it's way more motivating than thinking how the police chief is going to feel about getting less money. So I'm, I'm now in the book. So I agree with Carol that I think we need to have a separate meeting with the chief. I think the kinds of questions I would want to ask about are very different from the kinds of questions that the policies and spending committee. So for instance, I want to ask what actually happens with mental health calls at the moment and what's your experience and what, what are you thinking about that? What actually happens with domestic violence calls and what do you think and what's actually going on with that? Um, and my guess, um, Tell me, uh, tell me about what's happening now with when a drug overdose occurs and a police officer appears there and what's that. I, I want to hear her narrative about that. Um, I, um, and we'll have to decide about, let's, and I think she should get questions from us before the meeting so she's prepared. Um, we should, um, it, it, she ought to have things that she's been able to really prepare and think about so she doesn't have to say, I don't really know about that and I can't comment. Um, I have to say, I'm less interested in speaking with her about what would you do if we took away your money? I, that, so, um, so I guess what I wanna ask is, should we, are, can we decide, do we want to do this together with the other subcommittee or do we want to have a separate invite? Alex. Um, I would like it to be separate. Okay. Does anybody, I think all of us want it to be separate. Am I correct about that? Okay. Yes, Carol, go ahead. Sounds like you have more to say. No, I just wanted to clarify, I'm not, Having her invited to come to our subcommittee is not because I'm interested in what her emotional reaction or her reaction would be to losing in the budget. It's more that when I've been hired as an organizer in the past, I want to, I want to, I just want to observe where the resistance is going to be. I think for, because strategically that's important to me. You know, if I want to make major change, um, I'd really like to see not just documents. I want to the person who's in charge of that institution that is likely to be changed dramatically if we are effective. And it, because it, I just find that useful, you know, it, it helps me with my, the next phase of my strategy. So that, that's sort of where I'm coming from. It's not like, oh, uh, Jody, how are you going to feel if we move money? No, that's not where I'm coming from. Yeah, I, I think that's yes. that's what I call their narrative, right? How they explain, because your know, numbers are numbers, whatever they right. are, but right. their narrative, it's sort of the structure of, of ideas. That it tells you a lot. Yeah. It tells you a lot. 
that it can inform our next moves, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna end this discussion. Does anyone else want to entertain any other people that you want to consider inviting to a meeting? Because what I'm going to move on to next is when is our, I want to propose when our next meeting will be and whether we will have, an, oh, I'm sorry, there is another speaker we need to discuss and invite. Um, um, Hildegard Friedman, um, we've been speaking with frequently. Um, she represents a person living in governmental housing who has concerns about what happens with substance abuse that she sees around her. Um, she has wanted to speak with us more about that. I would like to invite her to at least give us a 10 minute proposal of her, what she has observed and what she feels about that. Is that okay with the rest of the committee? Now, another thing to do is to say, to use some public comment time for her to give a presentation also. Carol? I think that would be my inclination. She has um, signed on to public comment periods on a number of occasions, but if we gave her an invitation to just ex you know, focus her co to come on during that period and, and really specifically not just say what she sees or feels in her building, but what she thinks some of the um, responses should be, you know? And maybe give her a little more time. Okay. I'm I'm not sure I see inviting her to this meeting. I I sort it just seems to fit more with the public comment, but maybe other people have an, another sense of this. I don't know. Other thoughts. So I would be more than comfortable to offer her five to ten minutes. Um during the time that's normally part of public comment time that we will put her in for that amount of time. Yes, Javier. I, I agree with Carol, uh, with every single of those points. Yeah, and I agree with you, Booker. Alex, any thoughts? Is that okay with you or? Yeah. Um, are there other speakers that you would like to entertain? Because otherwise, um, there was you guys did some incredible work last night. Um, and actually, the hard part is I'm not sure what the decisions are. Um, there's an awful lot of food for thought. And I guess what I'm thinking about, what's spinning in my brain is how to do, how often should we meet, how to make the meetings more productive, um how to get more work done given the, our short timelines and we now i guess so what i need to reach with all of you now is let's have i want to propose that our next meeting is either in one or two weeks and i need to hear from you about that and that perhaps that next meeting one of the invited speakers will be um related to harm reduction in terms of substance abuse treatment. Um, I think we need to, I'll need to hear from Carol and Javier after they contact people of how much time we would wanna offer speakers for these other topics. Um, so I guess the first thing I'm gonna ask is when is the next meeting? Um, I actually like this amount of time of 7.30 till nine. Um, um, but should it be next week or should it be in two weeks? I, I would think we need to meet in a week if we can do that, but I'm curious to hear what all of you think. Am I taking you guys too fast to some things that you weren't, maybe you weren't thinking? No, not me. Okay. Uh, 
Um, I'm fine. Yeah, there is an outreach meeting <clears throat> on Monday night, this next Monday night. There's there's not a mission meeting, is there? No. Or is there? No. no. At the moment, it's still bi-weekly. Yeah. Um, so I can't do the 27th. I already have a meeting scheduled, which would be a week from today. Um, the 26th is possible, which is Tuesday. Um, but that is that would then conflict with the policies and services um, if we did a, a late time like this. Um, so um, yeah. Yes, Javier. What about the 29? I'm just thinking to have enough time to be able to communicate with everybody that we talked today. And I, I don't want to push it to weeks. So I think the furthest that I can think in my head is just the 29th, which is a Friday. Mm -hmm. I just put it on the table and that's my reasoning. If not, we can find a different time, a different time of day. Oh, you're you're open to meeting during the day, later in the week? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would be also. That day is open for me. Friday the 29th? Mm -hmm. What time would you want that meeting to be? Hopefully not Friday evening. No. What about 12th noon? Sounds okay to me. Um, do we want to sort of define a range because and dependent on when the speakers can come because we don't know if right. the speakers can come. Yeah. Let, let's can we leave it open no earlier than ten? So no no later than what? Or, a meeting that starts somewhere between eleven a, a meeting that goes from eleven thirty until one. Mm-hmm. And, and it'll be based and probably the speaker I'm going to speak to is because I think it's going to take some of you longer to be able to come up with people for the other meetings we're talking about. I may see if um, we can have this meeting be about the substance abuse issue. Okay. Because mm -hmm. we've, we've sort of already engaged with that speaker. Um, and I hopefully we can work that out quickly. Um, and then, and then the following meeting, perhaps a restorative focus on restorative justice. Hmm. Right. Friday. Friday, 20, 29th. And so the next, so let's talk about that next meeting, which would be. So I presume we will have a full meeting on next on the Tuesday, February 2nd. So another choice would be to meet then on February 3rd to, have, to talk about restorative justice, perhaps. Mm -hmm. That works for me. Mm -hmm. I'm here. And does this time of 7.30 to 9 work for you? Yes. 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 Um, good. Any, so the, those sound like, so the meeting on Friday, January 29th, hopefully will be with be about harm reduction. Um, as one of the topics on February 3rd, hopefully that it will have invited speakers talking about restorative justice. Mm -hmm. um, and are there other topics that any of you want to talk about if you have time at either of these other two meetings we're putting on now? I, by the way, I want to, I'm wondering, do we want to, if we have time on that January 29th meeting, do we want to talk about work process? I would love to talk about work process. I'd also like to have some time um, for the questions that we're we've come up with for the chief. 
uh, so that we could then get that invitation out there and <laughs> get those questions. Thank you, Alex. That's a really good, I forgot. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alex. So the agenda for that 1130 meeting will be other than substance abuse, it will also be finalizing questions to ask uh, the chief. Okay. And um, I will put on the agenda work as another agenda item work process. We may not have time to get to that, but we will try that. Uh, and I will also invite Hildegard to join us for the public comment. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions or thoughts? Um, it's helpful for me to have the meetings uh, laid out in advance further in terms of the schedule so I don't schedule something else. So do you want to talk about a meeting after the February 3rd meeting we're talking about? Yeah. Um, the 10th, I do already have another meeting that Wednesday, but the 9th would work. Tuesday the ninth. That would work work for me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, do we want to, I, Alex? I might ask if this is something you would feel comfortable doing. Do we want to tentatively invite Chief Casper to that theoretical meeting? Sure. Would you feel, would you be willing to invite her for that? I, I would be, um, I don't know if there's any need. I, I had a correspondence with her back in the fall. Um, and yeah, no, as long as I'm a representative of the, it doesn't have to be one of the chairs who does that. Um, but as long as it's a, uh, she, yeah, she said she wants to speak to the commission or two, 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 and and so um, I think at that point I said the chair would reach out, but uh, it would be fine. So yes, and I if, and if she would reach out. Me to reach out, I'd be more than glad to do that. So great. So we would let her know that we will have questions for her uh, after the 29th, mm -hmm. and then are proposing uh, 7:30 mm -hmm. on Tuesday, so there, February. It will be a public comment period. So she might not need to start until 8 p.m. Okay. I will say eight. Okay. That was a great suggestion, Alex. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Just um do we want to say the 17th Wednesday? I'm sorry. I didn't uh, know. Just do we want to schedule yet another meeting uh, and, and just get that in there? Uh, the 17th. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> for me, that's way too. <laughs> that's too far. Too okay. far, too far uh, out. No, I, I'm just going to put a placeholder you know, there. So I'm not little, scheduling anything. This is uh, what we'll see were, if that happens. This is what you guys were talking about last night. It's sort of this. We know <clears throat> a whole lot. <clears throat> Structure it up. <clears throat> Being honest with you, most of what was told yesterday, I feel that I feel pretty good about our about us. We came to present a fifteen pages document as as a as a preliminary report, and nobody presented <laughs> anything else. I, I feel. Uh, let me tell you this: I feel great about our subcommittee. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good. Like, so, <clears throat> So I learned a lot. So the reason I live in Northampton is because my wife is the Unitarian minister of UU Northampton. That's why I'm here instead of still being in Boston. Um, but in her prior life, she was a business person. Um, and, um, you know, and when she looks at the formatting of our committee, she said, there's no way the whole police commission can get anything done because there's too many. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> And the only way you can get work done is within this kind of committee. Um, and I, I, you know, I was watching the meeting about 
how should the formatting go? And I'm personally against having more large committee meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard to get everybody's yeah. into the room. Absolutely. And, um, and, and, you know, and I really appreciate all of your willingness to take on topics. Um, mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> and that you've also allowed me to be very, uh, without use of a better word, controlling, because I'm, I'm a very goals, results kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, it's the way white supremacist culture is affected. So, um, <laughs> you, you've obviously absorbed some of that. Yeah. I've absorbed <clears throat> the use of the use of time and productivity. Yes. <laughs> if need be, I will yeah. the rules of order. By the way, um, I, I now, I'm also going to say, so there's one error in the stuff I wrote, uh, um, which was, and Jody said, you know, you're wrong about the arrest records that I submitted sort of 12% of people in Northampton are black, 12% well, mm -hmm. said the report was arrest. That's wrong. It's actually because they don't break out arrests by yeah. in demographics. What I was quoting was use of force. So 12% uh -huh. of use of force was against black people. Um, All right. And um, with 2% with living. So that's actually worse than what we placed in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that went uncommented on. But in the future rewrites, we're going to need to fix that. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other topics people would like to discuss before we I entertain a proposal for adjournment? I just wanted to say that I appreciated in last night's meeting that that Dan took us uh, in the direction of uh, addressing the elephant in the room. Uh, the for this commission, it's very much you know um, two. There there's been pro a prominence of two tracks of thinking, and I heard a lot of really profound stuff last night that has been I think transformational for me in terms of. Um, where I might land at the end of this pro at, you know, at the end of our process. And, uh, I thought it was helpful that he opened, opened that up. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Cause that had been right. You know, it had been there in the commission and we need to, we need to find some way through this, you know, and, you know, people weighed in about the value of consensus or, or writing a report that just had different different views and you know what happens you know and i had expressed that last night that we don't we're not a jury we don't have to have anonymity we can issue a report with you know you could do this or you could do that and then i th thought about it afterwards and under those circumstances if that's what our report looked like you you pretty much know what the city would do very minimal reform right Ref minimal reform would win if there's lack of clarity from this commission. So I, you know, I just found it was, it was a long arduous meeting last night, but I, I found it personally useful at thinking as a commissioner. So really what are the values here you know, for me and what do I want to be a part of? So. Thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. You're still a therapist. Did I sound like a therapist? Oh, not at all. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I that's would, not that's not a compliment, by the way. I don't think. I would I wouldn't know what a therapist <laughs> sounds like. So. Well, I'm retired. I gave up my license just this month. <laughs> Any other? Comments? I don't want to be anybody's therapist. <laughs> you you're you're one of mine. Believe me. So right. that's, that's a, right. That's a that's, strong that's, statement, Carol. I don't want to be nobody's therapist. <laughs> no, I, I once had. It. I once had a client asking me, you know, how I love the clinical work. And I said, well, it pays my bills, you know, it, 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 it you know, it, it pays my operating expenses so I can go out and do community organizing. And she just looked appalled. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments, unless someone would like to make a motion for a term? I move. I so move. Second. Third. All, um, I'm going to take a quick roll call. Javier. 
Yes. Carol. Yes. Alex. Yes. I also vote yes. Thank you all so much for all the thought and uh, your recovery from yesterday and um, being so wonderful tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Take care, guys. Good to see you, everyone.